Okay, here we are with the grand experiment of virtual lectures. This is lecture 12. It's going to cover chap seven elements of chapter 3 and chapter 4 on Newton's laws of motion and his law of gravity. Um, as you can see, the video is going to track me. It's going to follow me around as I move from the board to the PowerPoint slides. If uh, you're having trouble seeing the PowerPoint slides in the video, the PowerPoint slides are going to be posted online as a PDF, so you can just follow along. Uh, I'd recommend watching the video on one computer screen, your tablet or your laptop, and then looking at um, the PowerPoint slides on a different screen or print them out um, and then follow along that way. Okay, so um, I'm hopefully getting this lecture to you right around the start of spring break, and I'd like you to watch it before the first Tuesday class after spring break. So during spring break, the best times to view the moon are very late at night. The moon is gonna be in its late waning phases, its late waning phases from the third quarter moon out to the new moon during the week of spring break, which means um, the best time to view the moon is after midnight, but before noon, early morning daylight is the easiest time. Uh, look for the moon as soon as you get up, as soon as you're dressed, as soon as you're going outside. Check to see if the sky is clear. Look to see if you see the moon. If you're out of the country, um, just try and choose the zip code that's closest to you and the time zone that's, that, that's right for you to use the dailymoonposition.com website. Um, but regardless, uh, just snap the picture on your phone and you and I could meet outside of class and figure out the best way to, to get the correct data uh, to enter into the Blackboard survey. So if you're out of the country, don't do the Blackboard survey. Just store the pictures on your phone and don't lose your phone. Um, when we get back from spring break, I'm going to be starting into Chapter 5 on light. So please read ahead of me. And um, this video will be posted on YouTube and linked, the, the YouTube video linked through Blackboard. All right, so when we left off before we uh, were, before the university was closed for the coronavirus, uh, we had covered Kepler's laws. So just as a quick review of Kepler's laws, um, his first law, planets orbit the sun in elliptical paths with the sun at one focus. So every planet's orbit is some elliptical shape. That might be a perfect circle. It could be a mildly distorted circle. It could be an extremely distorted circle, a cigar shape. Comets have cigar-shaped orbits. Planets, major planets, have fairly round orbits. Um, or it could be a straight line. If something just plunges in a straight line, starts with zero velocity, and falls straight down to another object, that is an orbit, and it's an elliptical orbit. It's an ellipse with eccentricity one, a straight line. If, on the other hand, the object has enough sideways velocity, just the right amount of sideways velocity, so that it just orbits in a perfect circle around a larger body, then that's a perfectly circular orbit, also an ellipse, an ellipse with eccentricity zero. The eccentricity is how squashed the orbit is from being a perfect circle. Eccentricity of zero, not squashed at all. Eccentricity of one, completely squashed into a straight line. All right, so the second of Kepler's laws states that uh, a planet's current orbital speed is inversely proportional to its current distance from the sun. And because of that, a line joining the planet to the sun will sweep out equal areas in equal time intervals. Um, the orbital speed being inversely proportional to its current distance is symbolized here. The orbital speed v is proportional to 1 over the distance. So if the distance gets larger, the speed will get slower. If the distance gets smaller, the speed will get greater. A planet's highest orbital velocity is going to be at perihelion, the point when it's closest to the sun, a planet's slowest orbital velocity will be at aphelion, 
when it's furthest from the sun. And then finally, we covered Kepler's third law, that the square of the orbital period of a planet around the sun is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So P here represents time. How much time does it take to make one 360 degree orbit? A represents the size of the orbit. The semi-major axis is the half the largest diameter for an ellipse. That is the equivalent of the radius of a circle because the semi-major axis is the average distance along the circumference of the elliptical path. It's the average distance from the sun. The sun is at one focus. A, the semi-major axis, is the average distance from all the points on the ellipse and one of the focus points. And as we covered last time, you just take P and you square it. That's equal to some constant times A cubed. If I measure P in years, scaled to the Earth's orbit, and A in astronomical units, also scaled to the Earth's orbit around the sun, then this C, this constant C, becomes really simple. It's exactly equal to one years squared per AU cubed. The units are years squared per AU cubed. So in that way, the units balance on both sides, but the numerical value of C is exactly equal to one, so I can ignore it when I'm using my calculator. It's invisible when I'm using my calculator. Anything A cubed multiplied by one is still just gonna be the numerical value of A cubed. So Kepler discovered these three rules. All the planets obeyed these rules, but he didn't understand why. These are empirical laws. Um, they were discovered by experiment without understanding the, the details of why they behave this way. In order to explain why they behave this way, we need to understand Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity. So, um, Here's the final scientist we're covering in the history of astronomy. Um, Sir Isaac Newton lived from 1642 to 1727. He was born on Christmas Day, the day that Galileo died, or the year that Galileo died. Um, Newton uh, invented the mathematical branch that we call calculus. He did it to solve a problem that one of his university professors claimed was an insolvable problem disturbed Newton so much that he worked and worked and worked on the problem until he realized that uh, it was unsolvable with the current state of mathematics, but if you developed the differential calculus branch of mathematics, you could solve the problem, and he did solve this unsolvable problem with it. Um, Newton revolutionized all of physics with his laws of motion and gravity such that um, anyone you know who's a STEM major, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, they at some point in their undergraduate degree are required to take physics. If you're a chemistry major, geology major, even a biology major or a pre-med major, you have to take physics and the first semester of your first year of physics is Newtonian mechanics. It's uh, a detailed study of all of this stuff. Um, and uh, in addition to all of this physics, all this physics of motion, Newton uh, was an expert in optics, uh, uh, better than Galileo. Um, he invented his own new form of telescope, the reflecting telescope that used a curved mirror to gather and focus light. And he dramatically under, uh, advanced our understanding of light itself. Um, and uh, we will cover that again in chapter five, more of his discoveries. And so with all of this, he's arguably the greatest scientist in history, even more impactful than Einstein. So to uh, talk about Newton's laws, we have to establish some jargon, some definitions. So here are a bunch of words that relate to motion. And I'm hoping you can see those on the screen. They're in blue text. If not, look at your PowerPoints. Um, so our first word is speed. These are all things you can measure. Speed, velocity, acceleration, force, momentum. 
These are measurements you could make of the real world. And so um, they are answers to questions. A measurement of the universe, a measurement of the real world is just an answer to a specific question. And the question you're asking with speed is how fast? How fast is something going? Uh, the technical definition to a scientist for speed is the rate of change of distance with time. Whenever you see the word rate, that's so similar to the word ratio, it's telling you it's going to be a fraction, particularly the units are going to be a fraction. And in this case, it's a ratio of distance divided by time. Usually the word rate implies that time is going to be in the denominator of that fraction. So for example, if you're on the Long Island Expressway, you might be in a section where the speed limit is 65 miles per hour. Miles on the top, hours on the bottom. Curses don't have any markers with me. Dun, dun, dun. So, uh, the units of speed are, for example, miles per hour. Uh, a unit of length divided by a unit of time. Distance divided by time the ratio of distance over time. And we've seen the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the fifth kilometers per second. Those are speeds. In everyday English, we use the word speed and velocity interchangeably, but to a scientist, those two words have slightly different meanings. S velocity is how fast and in which direction is the motion. And so velocity is speed plus direction. It's more than just speed. It's speed with a direction arrow, a measurement that we call a vector. If you hearken back to lecture two, certain measurements of the real world include numbers, units, and directions. We call those measurements vectors. We represent them with arrows. You're going to see that in the next slide. And so if you were driving on the Long Island Expressway, if you tell somebody, oh, I, I drove on the Long Island Expressway today, they might ask you, well, where did you go? Well, uh, I went to Montauk. So I was driving on the Long Island Expressway at 65 miles per hour in an eastward direction. Um, if I let this pen fall for a, sh for a short period of time, it might be moving downwards at three meters per second. And so I could symbolize the downwards with a negative sign. If I establish a direction convention, north is going to be positive, east is going to be positive, south is going to be negative, opposite of north, west is going to be negative, opposite of east, up is going to be positive, down is going to be negative. I can use the positive and negative signs to express the direction and then they become a familiar part of math and we can use them in mathematical equations. And so uh, our next measurement that we might ask about something that's moving is, is it accelerating? Acceleration is how fast is the speed changing? The rate of change of velocity. And so Again, it's going to be a ratio of velocity divided by time. So my units are going to be, for example, meters per second. There's my units of velocity divided by another time, divided by seconds. So meters per second per second. The, if I let this pen fall to the ground, as it's falling, it starts with speed zero. After a brief period of time, it is speeded up to a higher speed. After some more time, it's, speed, it's sped up to even a higher speed yet. Its speed is constantly increasing as it's falling. And so in American units, I would say it was falling at a rate, it's accelerating at a rate of 32 feet per second every second. 
It starts at zero speed. After one second of falling, it would be falling at 32 feet per second. After two seconds of falling, it would be falling at 64 feet per second. After three seconds of falling, it'd be falling at 96 feet per second. That same rate in metric units is 9.8 meters per second per second downwards with a negative sign. And since I'm dividing by seconds twice, I can treat them just like digits, treat units just like digits, and I can compact that into saying the downward acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. It's a meters per second divided by another second. And acceleration in our everyday uh, experience means speeding up. I accelerated. Um, Joe Biden's uh, collection of election delegates this month has accelerated. He's collecting more delegates and he's collecting them at a faster and faster pace with each set of primary election. Um, but to a physicist, we're not so picky. Speeding up, slowing down, those are both accelerations. In English, we might say that slowing down was a deceleration, but to a scientist, we just use a positive or negative sign. If the acceleration is positive, you're speeding up. If the acceleration has a negative value, then you're slowing down. A negative acceleration is a deceleration. And the other thing um, about acceleration is that, as I'll show you on my next slide, Turning is an acceleration, even if your speed isn't changing. If I get, on a, get in a car and drive on a cloverleaf entrance ramp onto the highway, and I uh, leave, say I, I drive my car down Hempstead Turnpike towards the Meadowbrook uh, Parkway, and I get on the entrance ramp to the Meadowbrook, and I turn south to get onto the entrance ramp, and I follow the loop around 180 degrees, so that I end up going north on the Meadowbrook during that whole turn. So here's Hempstead Turnpike. There's my cloverleaf entrance ramp. There's Meadowbrook Parkway. So Hempstead Turnpike, Meadowbrook Parkway. If I drew an arrow to represent my car's velocity at each point, I might be going 30 miles per hour there. I might be going 30 miles per hour here. I might be going 30 miles per hour here. I might be going 30 miles per hour here. I merge onto the Meadowbrook Parkway and I accelerate up to 60 miles per hour. But the whole time that I'm making this turn, my speed isn't changing, but my direction is changing. And Isaac Newton showed us that that is another example of an acceleration. Acceleration can mean speeding up, slowing down, and or turning. I can do combinations of these. I can speed up and turn. I can slow down and turn. I can just turn without changing my velocity at all. Our next definition is force. A force is simply a push or a pull in common everyday language. If you're pushing on something, you're exerting a force on it. If you're pulling on something, you're exerting a force on it. The, the Earth's gravity is pulling me down to the floor. There's a force of gravity. The Earth is exerting a force on me. Um, and so a force is a push or a pull. It's any action where a mass ends up being accelerated. An acceleration is a change in velocity, either speeding up, slowing down, or turning. So if I have anything in the universe, if I see anything in the universe, and it changes how it's moving, if it's not moving at all, so I've got, the uh, thing doesn't pan down low enough. If this pen is just sitting still in my hand and not moving at all, it has zero velocity. Suddenly it had more velocity. 
it was no longer zero velocity. It might have had a velocity of three meters per second horizontally. In order to change its state of motion, it was mo not moving at all. It was motionless. Suddenly it started moving. I had to exert a force on it by hitting it with my finger. The only way for something to start moving is if a force is acting on it. And so forces result in changes. Changes in speed, slowing up, speed, speeding up, slowing down, or changes in direction. If I want something to turn, I have to push on it. If I'm riding a bicycle and I want to turn, I need to twist the handles. I need to exert a force, a twisting force, on the handlebars, which will turn the front wheel, which will turn the bicycle. Um, I cannot turn the bicycle without a force. And as we'll see with Newton's laws, force is equal to a mass times an acceleration, just a simple multiplication. I take the amount of mass that has changed its motion through an acceleration, I multiply the mass by the acceleration, that tells me the force that was required to produce that acceleration. Since I'm taking the units of acceleration, meters per second squared, and I'm multiplying them by a mass, a unit of a mass is a kilogram, uh, I could have a force of one kilogram multiplied by meters per second squared. That's a big mouthful, a big fruit salad of units. So scientists have just decided to call that one Newton. One kilogram meter per second squared is a unit of force, a push or a pull, that we call a Newton. And when we translate it into our American units, one Newton is slightly less than one quarter of a pound. One Newton is 0 0.225 pounds. So rounding to the nearest 10, I weigh 200 pounds. Rounding to the nearest 10 in Newtons, I weigh around 800 Newtons, because there are four Newtons in each pound. So speed is just how fast, velocity is how fast and in which direction, acceleration is how, how much my, how rapidly my velocity is changing. It also is a vector with a direction. Forces, if I'm pushing or pulling, I'm pushing in a specific direction, I'm pulling in a specific direction. Those also have directions, they're vectors, forces are vectors. And then a final thing I can measure about motion is a property called momentum. Again, you have a, uh, in your head, you've got an idea of momentum. Joe Biden in the election right now has all the momentum. He is gaining delegates. He's looking like the presumptive nominee. Bernie Sanders is falling behind him. And so he does not have the momentum that Joe Biden has. Momentum is a physicist's way of measuring the tendency of a mass to maintain its current motion. If I have something that's sitting still, I say it has zero momentum, but it also has a tendency to remain at zero momentum. If I want to change its momentum, I have to use a force. I have to flick it with my finger to get the pen to move. Um, Momentum also has direction. Momentum is a measurement of the mass times the velocity. So a force is mass times acceleration. A momentum is a mass times a velocity, which gives us units of kilograms times meters per second. So if I have an object of 82.1 kilograms, uh, that would be an adult human, and they're running at 10 meters per second, that running human has a total momentum of 82.1 kilograms times 10 meters per second, 80, 821 kilogram meters per second. Okay, so basic definitions, speed, velocity, acceleration, force, momentum. Keep in mind that speed and velocity have a distinction. A speed is just a number and units, 65 miles per hour. 300,000 kilometers per second. But velocity is in which direction? Instead of just talking about it, the speed of a beam of light, 
I could say a beam, the velocity of a beam of light would be 300,000 kilometers per second headed towards the sun, 300,000 kilometers headed towards the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, 300 kilometers per second headed towards the nearest galaxy, Andromeda. All right, so this next slide is going to be really dense once I fill up, once I add all the animations to it. So uh, look at your printout, rewind the video, watch this a few times. So I'm going to have a car here traveling in a straight line, and it's going to be accelerating, speeding up. So it's just left a red light, and it's now accelerating down Hempstead Turnpike. And on my diagram here, if I draw a red arrow, that's going to represent the current velocity at the point at the bottom of the arrow, at the back end of the arrow. So the car at this moment has this velocity in that direction. So the arrow points in the direction of the velocity, and the length of the arrow represents the number, the magnitude, how fast is something going. The length of the arrow represents the speed, the direction of the arrow represents the direction of the speed, so the arrow in total represents the velocity. And so that length of a red arrow might represent 10 meters per second. My car starts off at this point right here, moving at 10 meters per second. But its speed is increasing with time. The car is moving faster and faster and faster in this scenario. So my blue arrow is going to represent the direction and strength of the current acceleration. How much is the speed changing every second? And so this blue arrow, the length of the blue arrow represents the numerical value of the acceleration, and the direction of the blue arrow represents the direction of the acceleration. And so that blue arrow, I'm going to scale them the same. My blue arrow is half the length of my red arrow, so it represents a change in velocity of 5 meters per second every second. So 5 meters per second squared. And so if I let the car accelerate with that acceleration of plus 5 meters per second every second, if I let it do that for one second, then I want to take the car's former velocity, one second in the past, it's going to keep that velocity because the car has momentum. So I can represent that as a faded arrow. Um, and then I can add to it. This is one second later. This is, this is where the car started with a, with a velocity of 10 meters per second in that direction accelerating five meters per second every second, also in the same direction, then a second later, the car is going to be here at the base of this arrow. It's going to have the same speed it had before, plus the amount of speed it gains in one second, which is going to be just adding the blue arrow onto the red arrow. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to multiply it by one second's worth of acceleration. One second times five meters per second per second is going to give me five meters per second. I'm going to add five meters per second onto my old velocity. I'm going to get my new velocity one second later, and that's going to be 15 meters per second. Doing a real simple, simple scenario here. So every second, my car starts with 10 meters per second. Every second, it's going to increase its speed by five meters per second. So one second later, it's going to gain five meters per second, and it's going to be moving at 15 meters per second. And then we do the same thing. One second later, the car is going to move forward. I'm going to continue to accelerate with that constant acceleration of five meters per second per second. And so one second later, the car will have moved to this location. It's going to have the same velocity it had one second ago, 15 meters per second, but in the ensuing second, it's going to have gained another five meters per second. 
And so its net velocity now is going to be 20 meters per second. And so I can see, I can just, I can figure out the car's speed at any point in the future just by taking its current velocity and adding how much acceleration it has multiplied by how much time I'm considering. I considered a net change of one, two seconds. I maintained a constant acceleration of five meters per second for each one of those seconds. So plus five meters per second times two seconds means I'm gonna take my original velocity of 10 meters per second and I'm gonna add 10 meters per second to it. Newton gave us this formalism for describing the motions of moving things while they're accelerating. And it's, it's really simple. If the current velocity and the current acceleration are parallel in the same direction, your car is accelerating and its speed will increase. So two seconds of acceleration at plus five meters per second per second increases the velocity by 10 meters per second starting at 10, increasing it by 10, up to 20 meters per second. Now we're gonna look at the opposite scenario. My car left a stop sign, accelerated up to 20 meters per second, was driving down the street for a while, and then a stop sign is coming up, so the driver applies the brakes and the car decelerates. The car slows down to a complete stop. So at the start of my motion, I might choose to start when the car was moving to the right at 15 meters per second. So the length of my arrow is one and a half times as long as that one. It's equal to that one. It's three quarters of that one. It's 15 meters per second long. It's in that direction. That's the car's current velocity when the center of the car is at that point. By applying the brakes, a force is generated between the car and the road. The tires, where the tires are meeting the road, a force is being generated through the action of the brakes. And so I could say that the, uh, that the speed is gonna change by negative five meters per second per second. The negative indicates that if positive is to the right, then negative is to the left. And so my arrow points left. My arrow is one third the length of my red arrow. My blue arrow is one third the length of my red arrow because it represents a length of five meters per second. And it's going to change by that much every second that I apply this negative acceleration. So one second from now, the car is moving in this direction. So one second from now, it's still gonna be further over here, and its momentum would want it to continue with that velocity. So I'm gonna move this, I'm just gonna duplicate this arrow over here where the car is gonna be a second from now. So there it is. I'm gonna add these two vectors together, these two arrows together, but this arrow is in the opposite direction. When I added my arrows together, I put the, the bottom of the blue arrow at the tip of the red arrow. I put the bottom of the blue arrow at the tip of the red arrow. Here I'm gonna put the bottom of the blue arrow at the tip of my red arrow, and it's going to subtract away from it. Adding a negative number is the same thing as subtracting a number. And so my new velocity is gonna be the original velocity minus the acceleration. It's going to be that long. 15 minus five, it's gonna be 10 meters per second long. And so my net, uh, my net velocity at this point is gonna be 10 meters per second. My, I'm gonna continue that one second further into the future. I'm gonna take my 10 meter per second arrow. I'm gonna move it over to here to where the car will be one second from now. Um, and I'm gonna to continue to decelerate the car at minus five meters per second. So I'm gonna take this arrow, move it over to here. I'm gonna take my blue arrow, move it over to here, line them up tail to tip. So I'm gonna subtract that blue arrow off from it. I'm gonna be left with 
five meters per second, just like, you know, one second, I drop five meters, another second, I drop five meters per second. And then one final, one final application of that, once more, for one more second, I'm going to slow down by minus five meters per second per second, and that's going to slow me down to zero. And now my, um, my car has come to a stop. So in summary, three seconds of acceleration with a value of minus five meters per second per second, three times minus five is minus 15, three seconds times minus five meters per second per second, one of those per seconds cancels out, I'm left with a change in velocity of minus 15 meters per second. If I started at positive 15 meters per second and I subtract away 15 meters per second, I have ended up with a speed of zero meters per second. And the way brakes work is they only slow a car down if it's already moving. If, you're, if your car is parked and you step on the brake, nothing happens. So once the brakes have brought the car to a stop, the car just stops because the brakes don't work on a non-moving car. So we can see that positive accelerations increase your speed, negative accelerations decrease your speed, and Newton told us that um, forces are necessary to change accelerations. And accelerations are changes in velocities, but an acceleration can be a speeding up, a slowing down, or a turn. And it's the or a turn part that's uh, trickier to visualize. But here, I've got a car making a turn, say, on the entrance ramp, the cloverleaf entrance ramp from the Hempstead Turnpike onto the Meadowbrook Turnpike. The Meadowbrook Turnpike. Meadowbrook Turnpike. Um, and so my car starts here, moving in that direction, but it's going to end over here, moving in this direction. It's going to have made a turn. And so I'm going to start by drawing my red arrow for my velocity, and that might represent a current speed of 10 meters per second in that direction. So I'm going kind of, if we call that north and that east, the car is going northeast at 10 meters per second. If my blue arrow is parallel to my red arrow, I speed up. We saw that in this scenario. If my blue arrow points in the opposite direction of my red arrow, I slow down. What happens if the blue arrow neither points parallel to or opposite to my red arrow? Newton had this brilliant insight. It doesn't have to, your acceleration doesn't have to be parallel or opposite of your current velocity. It can point in any direction it wants. And so, if, if this is in the same direction, this is in the opposite direction, an interesting question is what happens if it points in a perpendicular direction? So I have a little bit of acceleration here. Let's say it's two meters per second squared, but I'm applying it perfectly perpendicular to the direction that the car is currently moving. And I just follow the same rules. Uh, one second later, I wanna take my original red arrow move it to where the car is going to be one second later, but then I want to add the blue arrow to it, adding it to the tip of the arrow. And so I can see here that what's going to happen is my arrow is just going to turn, that this, this blue acceleration is essentially just grabbing the tip of the arrow and pulling it sideways. Because it's not in the same direction as the arrow, it's not going to add to the speed, but it's not in the opposite direction of the arrow. It's not going to subtract from the speed. It's just going to reorient the direction of the speed without changing the numerical value of the speed. And so one second later, I will have turned a little bit, but I won't have changed my speed. I'll still be moving at 10 meters per second because the blue arrow is perpendicular to my red arrow. It doesn't add to it, it doesn't subtract to it, it just tugs on it and turns it. 
And similarly, if I continue to pull on it perpendicularly, such that the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity, the new turned velocity, so as the red arrow turns, I also turn the blue arrow by the same amount so that they're still perpendicular, then the same thing is just going to keep happening. One second later, my car will have moved to here. It will still be moving at 10 meters per second, but now it's turned so that it's moving due east. So if this car was moving northeast, this car was moving east of northeast, this car is moving east, I continue to pull on it perpendicularly, accelerate it perpendicularly, and so now it's moving east of southeast, and now it's moving southeast. So I went from a car that initially was moving northeast, and now the car is moving southeast. I've turned the car 90 degrees in tiny little increments in a nice smooth curve, and during the whole point, during every point on the curve, my speed never changed, but my velocity did change. The velocity includes the direction. The direction was constantly changing, the speed was never changing. Newton showed us that the only way that can happen, the only way you can turn, is if you accelerate in a perpendicular direction to your current motion. So speeding up is accelerating parallel to your motion. Slowing down is speeding up in the opposite direction of your motion, i.e. decelerating, subtracting from your current motion. And turning is accelerating perpendicular to your current motion. And I can do combinations of these. If I took my blue arrow and I had it oriented not parallel to my red arrow, not perpendicular to red arrow, but 45 degrees pointing ahead of my red arrow, it would simultaneously add to the velocity and turn the velocity. So I would turn and accelerate. If I had my blue arrow pointing at a 45 degree angle backwards, I would turn and decelerate. Some of the arrow would subtract from my speed, the rest of the arrow would be perpendicular, turning me. And so, all sorts of motions, Newton discovered that you can represent it with an arrow for your current velocity, an arrow for your acceleration, and how your velocity changes just depends on the angle between the acceleration arrow and the velocity arrow and the magnitude, the size, the length of your velocity arrow and the length of your acceleration arrow. Speeding up, slowing down, turning, turning at constant speed, turning and accelerating at the same time, turning and decelerating at the same time, they can all be represented by combinations of red velocity arrows and blue acceleration arrows. And so, Four seconds of acceleration, where the acceleration is always perpendicular to the velocity at that moment, just turns the velocity without changing its speed. You make a turn at constant speed, like you do here when you're merging onto a highway, going through a cloverleaf turn, you might maintain your car's speed at 30 miles per hour, um, but you're constantly changing. You were traveling east, then southeast, then south, now you're traveling west, now you're traveling northwest. Once you merge onto the Meadowbrook Parkway, you're going north. And so you started turning east, now you're going north. You did it at a constant speed, you made the turn at a constant speed, um, but you were accelerating the whole time. You were just accelerating sideways, inwards, towards the center of the circular path that you're turning in. Uh, note that these blue arrows are all pointing towards the center of this circle that the car, the circular path that the car is taking, the acceleration arrows all point inwards. Okay, so, whew, lots of stuff there. Um, now I want to relate this to your own personal experience. I want you to imagine what your body would feel in each of these scenarios. So the scenario where you're in a car and it accelerates up to twice its current speed. Think about that and think about what your body is going to tell you. 
Aristotle argued that the earth couldn't be in motion because we would feel the earth's speed. Well, you do feel changes in your motion. And what would you feel in this scenario? If, if I'm a passenger in a car, seat belted into the car, and the driver steps on the accelerator, steps on the gas pedal, and the car speeds up, I'm going to feel mm, pulled backwards. The red arrow is pointing forwards. The blue arrow is pointing forwards. I'm going to feel pulled backwards in the opposite direction of both of those arrows. Let's look at this scenario, though. If I'm in a car that's traveling at 15 meters per second, you can just as easily think, imagine this is 15 miles per hour, and I, the driver steps on the brakes and comes to a complete stop in three seconds, steps on the brake hard, and slows me down from 15 miles per hour to zero miles per hour in three seconds, I'm going to feel, ooh, Hold forward. I'm going to be straining against the seatbelt because the car is decelerating rapidly. So I'm going to be pulled forward, pulled in that direction, parallel to the red arrow, but opposite the blue arrow. Here I was pulled backwards, opposite the red arrow and opposite the blue arrow. I see that there's a pattern emerging here. The pull that I feel when I accelerate or decelerate is in the opposite direction of my acceleration. Here the blue arrow points to the right, I feel pulled to the left. Here the blue arrow pulls to, uh, points to the left, I feel pulled to the right. And we see that the pattern continues. So while you're accelerating, you would feel pulled backwards into your seat opposite the acceleration. When you're decelerating, you feel pulled forwards towards the dashboard of the car opposite the current acceleration. If you're slowing down, decelerating, your blue arrow is pointing to the back of the car. The acceleration vector is pointing to the back of the car. And so what your body feels is the opposite of the acceleration in this scenario. What your body feels is the opposite of the acceleration in this scenario, and sure enough, if you imagine being a passenger in a car that's making a sharp turn to the right, you and everybody in the car feels pulled to the left. Um, so it's the opposite of the current acceleration. While you're turning to the right, your acceleration is pulling you to the right of your current direction, and you feel pulled outwards to the left, opposite your current acceleration. We're going to come back to this idea. Our body feels the opposite of our acceleration. We don't feel our speed. Notice here, the speed was forward and to the right. You felt back, pulled backwards and to the left. Here, the speed is forward and to the right. You feel pulled forwards and to the right. So it's in common there. Here, the pull is always perpendicular to your current direction. You feel always pulled outwards to the left, always in a different direction, but not parallel or opposite your red arrow, but definitely always opposite your blue arrow, opposite your blue arrow, opposite your blue arrow. All right, so we're going to take a, a short pause here. This will be one unit, and then I will post another video and another video to break the lecture up into small digestible units. So uh, think about these slides, make sure you understand everything, and then play the next video.